If you will, take your Bibles and let's open to Revelation chapter 21, the very end of the Bible. We're going to read verse 5 and we'll come back to this passage at the end of our sermon this morning. Revelation 21 and verse number 5. Of course, today is the last day of the year. Tomorrow begins a new year. And while in reality it's just another day, the next one that follows, you know, on the calendar and the progression of days in our lives, we tend to look at uh, occasions such as this as time for a new start. We come to the end of the year and we look back to the past and over the past year and we think about the coming year and the future and we make resolutions and plans and goals and hopes and dreams and there's nothing wrong with doing that. In fact, it's a good thing to do and we ought to do it more than one day a year to think about our past and our, our future and see where we are. But there are some things that are more important than New Year's resolutions and starting a new year and that kind of clean slate. And one of those things, of course, is the new life we have in Christ, because it literally is a clean slate and a new start. And as Jesus says here in Revelation 21 and verse 5, he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto him, to John, Write, for these words are true and faithful. What Jesus has revealed to John and has been written in this book is true and faithful. And the statement that he just made is also true and faithful. And that means that it's right, it's accurate, and that you can count on it. And what he says is, I make all things new. More than a new year, everything can be made new in Christ. And I want us to think about that idea and look at some verses in the New Testament that talk about the newness that we have in Christ. And I think it'll be a, an interesting study for us. So I want us to start by going back to Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 28 when Jesus was instituting the Lord's Supper and when the Bible begins to teach us about a new testament. So when Jesus says that he will make all things new, that started with a new covenant, a new testament between God and men. God had made covenants with man several times in the past. We think about the covenant with Noah after the flood, the, the symbol of that covenant being the rainbow that God would never flood the earth with water again. There's the covenant that he made with Abraham, the covenant with the nation of Israel through the giving of the law of Moses, and, and on and on, different promises that God had made. But in the Old Testament, in Jeremiah 31, God promised and predicted that he would establish a new covenant with man. And when Jesus came into this world as the Messiah, the Son of God, he came to bring into being that new covenant. So when he was instituting the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26 and verse 28, he says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now there are a couple of things we need to think about when we think about a New Testament. Why a New Testament and why would God do this? And one thing we need to notice, first of all, is here in the context of the book of Matthew, when you go back to chapter 9, verses 16 and 17, we begin to see that Jesus is talking about the uh, freshness of the gospel. And he uses this illustration, Matthew 9 and verse 16, No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put uh, in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. And the illustration there, of course, is if you have an old garment that's been you know, washed and, and worn and all of those things, and it gets a hole in it, and you patch it with new material, when you then wash that new material, it's going to shrink like the old did, and it won't be enough to cover the tear, and it'll rip, and you'll have a, another hole that has to be fixed. So you don't put new with the old. The same with the wine skins. The wine skins, of course, were made from animal skin, and over time, they would age and, and become more dry and brittle and so forth. If you put new wine in there, when it starts to ferment, it expands, and the, the skin can't expand with it because it's old, and so it ruptures, and all the, the wine spills out. Now, what did Jesus mean by that? He meant that you can't take his new gospel 
and put it into the Old Testament. The two don't go together. Now, the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, but the two do not belong together in the sense that you can't have two laws at the same time. And so what Jesus was teaching in principle here is that when he institutes his new covenant, it would be the end of the old covenant. And the reason for that is because this is a fresh covenant. It's new and it's fresh, and it's always going to be that way. And there's another way he illustrates that in chapter 13 of Matthew, down at verse number 52. And in this passage, this is what Jesus says. Uh, He says, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. And he's talking about, in Matthew 13, Jesus was teaching in parables, and explaining why he taught in parables. And what he's saying is that he asked them in verse 51, have you understood all these things? And he says, as you understand his word and as you continue studying it and continue learning it and to continue growing in it, you're going to be able to pull out of your, your treasure bag old things that you have learned, but also new things. And that's a fact about the Bible and especially about the New Testament. The more that we study it, the more we learn. We're always finding something new, something fresh. No matter how many times we've read it or or studied it, you'll see something that you haven't seen before or you'll build on something that you've learned previously and you'll get a new understanding of it. And that's how the gospel works. It's how God has designed his word. And so it's a new covenant First of all, because it's new and fresh, it's different from the old covenant, but also because it is ever new, and it's always going to be new and always going to be fresh because it is the word of God, it's the gospel of Jesus, and there's life in that word. And so that's one aspect of the New Testament that Jesus has brought into being. The second aspect, of course, is that the new and the old don't mix together and with the coming of the new the old came to an end because the gospel is better it's it's new because it's better and I want us to read that over in Hebrews chapter 8 and and think about this idea because it's important to understand that when not just when we talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament but when the Bible talks about the old and the new covenants the Old Testament didn't become the Old Testament because it had been around so long and now it's old. It became the Old Testament because there was a new one. That's why it's the Old Testament, because there was a New Testament that came into force and into effect. The New Testament today is almost as old as the Old Testament was in Jesus' day. But it's not the Old Testament because it's been around for almost 2,000 years. It's still the New Testament because it's new and it's fresh, but also because it is better than and superior to the Old. And not just the Old Testament, but to every other testament or system or religious belief or practice or whatever. The gospel is superior, and it is the superior covenant. Here's how the writer of Hebrews said that in Hebrews 8, starting uh, at verse number 8. He says, for finding fault with them. And if you notice in verse 7, he's talking about the first covenant. That's the Old Testament. For finding fault with them, he saith, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So this is from Jeremiah 31, when God promised to give a new covenant. And notice that he says, God said this when he found fault with them. So he gave the old covenant, but they didn't obey it, and they weren't faithful to it, and they weren't keeping it. And so God says, I'm going to give a new covenant, because they didn't keep the first one. And it's going to be different, not the same kind of covenant, not according to the same that he had done. Verse 10, he says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. 
And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So notice, the old covenant became old when God said a new covenant. So it's not about age or time. It's about the fact that God was going to replace it with the new. And the reason he would replace it with the new is, number one, because they didn't keep the old covenant. And number two, because God had a better covenant. And the better covenant is the new because in it, God is merciful to our unrighteousness and our sins and our iniquities are remembered no more. And the writer of Hebrews is going to go in, into a discussion about how under the Old Testament their sins and their iniquities were remembered. On the Day of Atonement, once, one day a year, the high priest went into the most holy place with blood to offer sacrifice for himself and the sins of the people. And the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 10, there was a remembrance made of sin again year by year continually. So under the Old Testament... Sins weren't forgiven in the sense that they were completely removed because only the blood of Jesus can take away sins and it hadn't been shed yet. And so they were forgiven in prospect of the fact that God was going to send a Savior. So in the meantime, their sins still weighed them down. We just sang that song about his yoke is easy, his burden is light. That's the great invitation that Jesus offers in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He's not talking about people who work hard for a living, and have to carry heavy stuff around and do manual labor. He's talking about people who are weary and burdened by their sins because they remembered them year after year after year. He says, if you come to me, I'll remove that burden and I'll put my yoke on you. I'll join you to me and my yoke is easy and my burden is light because sins and iniquities are remembered no more. That's better than the old covenant. It provides something that the old covenant couldn't provide because it only had the blood of bulls and goats. We have the blood of Christ. So in chapter 9 of Hebrews in verse 14, he says, How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So it's a better covenant because it offers a purging of the conscience. That is a complete and total removal of sin, which makes our conscience clean. So part of the new covenant is that we get a new conscience, a new mind, a new mindset, a new way of thinking, a new way of seeing. We get to see the world as forgiven people, people without sin not that we've never sinned and never done wrong and we have and we know those things and we remember them and we regret them but in Christ we know that they're removed forever and so we see the world differently and that gives us that promise of eternal inheritance and that's why over in Hebrews chapter 10 he calls it a new and living way in verse number 20 it's a new way because there's life in it the Old Testament was a covenant of death because it said the wages of sin is death and if you sin you die and you have sinned and so you're under the penalty of death and the only hope you have is for God to be merciful and remove your sins. The new covenant says God is merciful. He has removed your sins so you're not under death anymore. This is a living way. It's filled with life and that's new. And aren't we thankful for the new covenant? And it's always heartbreaking to see so many who claim to be Christians and to follow Christ want to go back to that old covenant and to hold on to bits and pieces of it and parts of it. And they don't understand that when you bind yourself to that old law, you have to keep the whole thing. And there's no life in that Old Testament system. We need the blood of Christ. But that brings us to the next point, that with a New Testament, there's also a new worship. 
Jesus said there in Matthew 26 about instituting the Lord's Supper. He's talking about the fruit of the vine. He says, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Then he said, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so Jesus is talking about partaking of the Lord's Supper in a new way. That's a new kind of worship. And the idea is that under the Old Testament system, of course, everything was physical and focused on the performing of certain acts and so forth. But under the New Testament, worship is spiritual. And that doesn't mean that it wasn't spiritual under the Old Testament. John 4.24 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That was also true under the Old Testament. You had to do what God said to do in worship, but your heart was supposed to be involved in it. I mean, just read the, the Psalms that they sang and, and see how the, the heart and the emotions were involved. So it was supposed to be that way, but it was focused on the, the ritual, the material side of things. But under the new covenant, Jesus says that he will drink of the fruit of the vine new with us in the Father's kingdom. Well, the kingdom is the church. And we partake of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week because the Lord has commanded us to. And so that means we're partaking of this fruit of the vine that symbolizes his blood, represents his blood to us. And Jesus promises here that he will drink it with us. But this is a new kind of worship in that he's not with us here physically on the earth, but he is with us spiritually. And so we worship in spirit and in truth. And that means that our heart is in the right place and we have the right motivation and we do what God has told us to do in worship. But it also reminds us that when we engage in worship, we are engaging in spiritual communion, fellowship with our Lord, that Jesus is present with us, that when we sing songs of praises, he's actually listening to us. When we pray, our Father in heaven hears our prayers. He may not be sitting here in the building, but he is with us. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, they are in fellowship with us. And so our worship is in spirit and in truth. Now, here's, I think, the key to understanding that. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse number 3, and really this whole chapter talks about this idea, but we'll just pull out a few verses that demonstrate it to us. Paul, of course, writing to the Corinthians says, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. So Paul says they were his letter. Now Paul had written this letter, 2 Corinthians, and he was writing it with ink on paper or whatever. But he says, the real letter is you, Christians, you, you converts. You are the, the, the letter or the testimony of Paul's work and of his preaching and so forth. But he says that that letter was written not on tables of stone, which of course is like the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, but it's written in the heart by the Holy Spirit. And that's what happens when God works through his word on us today. He writes his word on our hearts. And that's what the prophecy about the new covenant was from Jeremiah 31 that we just read in Hebrews 8. God said, I'll write it on their hearts. So we put God's word in our heart and the Holy Spirit works through that word on us internally. So there's the spiritual aspect of it. Well, then in verse 6 he says, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. 
And so he's comparing here the Old Testament to the New. When he talks about the letter and the letter killeth, he's talking about the Old Testament. When he's talking about the Spirit that gives life, he's talking about the New. And he says that the Old Testament, written and engraven in stones, was glorious. And you think about when God appeared on Mount Sinai and gave that law, there was a manifestation of glory And there was thundering and lightning and darkness and and all of those things, but it was still showing the majesty and the power and the awesomeness and the glory of God. And Paul says about that glory that it was to be done away, that the glory that appeared there and was found in the law of Moses was not to be forever, but it was going to, to fade away. It was going to come to an end. But he says, if that system that was temporary and was a ministration of death because it showed condemnation for sin and didn't provide the remedy ultimately, if that was glorious, then how much more glorious is the New Testament, which is a, a ministration of life? And the glory that is revealed when it was given, of course, is the glory of the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, the glory of the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, that manifestation of power. And it gives life through the sacrifice of Christ. And so he's making that contrast to show us the spiritual nature of the new covenant. Now, the conclusion of that is down in verses 17 and 18. He says, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed in the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So Moses came down from the mountain. His face was shining because he'd been in the presence of God. And the children of Israel told him to cover it with a veil. And Paul tells us in this chapter that the reason they wanted his face covered was so they wouldn't see the glory fade because the fading of the glory from Moses' face indicated that this system was going to fade away. But he says under the new covenant, there is no veil. There's nothing shielding us from it because it's never going to fade away. It's going to continue until the Lord returns. This is the new covenant and it's the last covenant. It's the final testament of God. And so he says, we with open face, nothing between us and the glory that God has revealed in the new covenant, we look directly into the heart of God by looking into the word of God. And we find in that word, that truth that is revealed to us, liberty and glory. And so the principle is that when we live according to the New Testament, when we understand the spiritual nature of the law of Christ and the nature of the the worship that, of course, comes out of it, we, we understand that it's rooted in life, not death, and it's grounded in freedom, not bondage. So in Christ, we are free We're free from sin, we're free from the curse of sin, we're free from the punishment of sin, and ultimately we're free from from death. Even though we'll die, we know that we still have life and there's a resurrection from the dead and eternal life in heaven. And God has made all that known to us through the Holy Spirit revealing this word to us. Now, having that understanding of the freedom we have in Christ and the life we have in Christ... How can we not worship our God? How can we not be overjoyed to assemble and to sing praise to the one who has done all of this for us? He didn't give us tables of stone where every commandment on the Ten Commandments carried the death penalty. If you break this, you die. Instead, he gave us a law that says, you deserve to die, but I took your place. My son was nailed to the cross so that you don't have to suffer this punishment. Instead, you can have life and you can have liberty. That's what motivates our worship. And that's how worship is in spirit and in truth. And that's how it's new under the New Testament from what it was under the Old Testament. As important as Old Testament worship was, there's a newness to it that we find under the New Testament. And so Jesus drinks with us new 
in the Father's kingdom. There's a new aspect to our worship. And again, by the way, just to throw this in here, we, we talked about people who try to go back to that Old Testament system. You know, that's one of the faults with using instrumental music in worship. Let's say we just, in our last sermon last Sunday, we read from one of the Psalms that talked about praising God on instruments and whatever. And people say, well, they did that in the Old Testament. Why can't we do it today? Well, we're not under that system. And not only are we not under it, we don't want to be under it. And in the New Testament, the focus is not on the material, but the spiritual. And our worship is to come from the heart and to be expressed in the means that God has commanded us to use our voices singing words that teach and admonish. Music may be beautiful and it may be stirring to the emotions or whatever, but it's a physical part of a physical system and it's never meant to be a part of the spiritual worship that we enjoy in Christ. It's an entirely different system and it's based on you know, this, this different, this new principle and so this is the new worship that we enjoy in Christ. Now, just real quickly, these last few points. In John 13, verse 34 and 35, we learn about all things being made new. We learn about a new commandment. And that commandment, of course, is to love one another as I have loved you. And so Jesus teaches us in that passage that love is the new commandment. Now, we understand from that that obviously God has always commanded people to love him and to love one another. So when Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. He's telling us that the commandment may be old, but the newness of it is to love as he loved. So under the Old Testament, obviously men knew of the love of God. And God had done great things and wonderful things, demonstrating his power and his majesty and also his love. But there was no greater demonstration of the love of God than the sacrifice of Jesus. His coming into this world, living as he did, dying on the cross, being raised from the grave. And so when Jesus says it's a new commandment, he means that it's a commandment that's been demonstrated in a new way. God has shown his love through the giving of his son. And so we are to love as he loved us, being willing to give our lives for one another. He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And he wants us to live not to be served, but to serve others and to give our lives in service to God and to others. He says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. When you add to that what he says in John 15, and verses 12 and 13, we find another aspect of this. He says, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And again, that's what Jesus did in demonstrating that love for us, and he wants us to be willing to do the same. So when you look in 1 John, in chapter 2, he says it's a new commandment, but it's, it's really an old commandment. It's not new, but then he says it is a new commandment. So the commandment to love has always existed, but the new aspect of it is as it's been demonstrated by Christ. And so when we have this new covenant and this new worship that is grounded in our life and our liberty in Christ, that motivates us to love, to love God more than ever before and to love our neighbor as ourself and to be willing to give all that we have to serve God and to serve our fellow man. And that's the new love, the new commandment that we find in Christ. But then we go to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 and we learn that in Christ, he makes all things new. He makes us a new creation this is such a, a powerful passage and teaching from Paul. He says, again, this is 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The King James Version says the word there means creation. He's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And then he says, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, 
to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And so Paul teaches us that we are made a new creature in Christ by reconciliation. Reconciliation, of course, is taking people who were enemies and the problem that existed between them is, is reconciled, it's rectified, it's removed. And so these enemies are made at peace. And that's what God was doing through Christ. Mankind, his enemies, because we were disobedient and rebellious, the thing that stood between us and God was our sins. And to reconcile that, those sins had to be forgiven and for God to be able to do that justly and righteously, a perfect sinless man had to pay the price for sin. And so Jesus died on the cross, making reconciliation available. So when our sins are forgiven by the blood of Christ, we are reconciled with God and we become a new creation, a new person. And so that happens by God taking away our sins it happens according to Galatians 6, 14, and 15 through crucifixion, which is where we crucify the old man and put on the new man. And so we have to put to death our previous sinful practices and don't do those things anymore. And then Ephesians 4, 24 and Colossians 3, 10 talk about being made new through righteousness. Not only do we stop doing what was wrong, but we start doing what is right. And that's how you put on the new man and so in Christ we are made completely new we have a new mindset a new view of things we see things correctly from God's perspective and that then motivates us to live a new life not practicing wrong but doing what is right and that's the new creation we are in Christ in turn that gives us a new name and that new name for us today, here and now, is, of course, the name Christian. Acts 11 and verse 26, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. What a privilege it is, and one that we should never take lightly or take for granted, that God allows us to wear the name of his son. That name was not given by man. It was not given in derision or in mockery. But the words that are used in Acts 11:26 tell us, that this was a name given by God. They were called by God Christians, these who were disciples. So God chose the name and he gave it to us, allowing us to wear the name of his only begotten son. We're so unworthy to, to wear that name. But through the power of the blood of Jesus, we are given that new name. And so we all have our own names and our, our own identities through you know, our, our family and our bloodline and through our occupation and our roles in the work and our, work, our roles in the home and all these different names and titles that we wear. But there is no greater name to wear than the name Christian. And when we wear that name, we ought to realize that as we go out into the world, we are representing Christ to the world because we wear that name. And so we need to live accordingly. But Revelation 2 tells us that that's not the only new name that we are given. We have that new name here, but we'll also have a new name in eternity. And notice this passage. It says in verse 17, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving him that receiveth it. And so there's a new name that God will give us in heaven. Now, in connection with that is chapter 3 and verse 12 of Revelation, which says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. So there are two aspects to this new name. One is that it's the name of God. And if you notice throughout the book of Revelation, there's a lot of talk about things written on foreheads and things written on hands. Those who belong to God have his name written on their forehead. That's God claiming ownership. And then there's the mark of the beast, as it's sometimes called. You have the mark of Satan on your forehead or in your hand. All that means is that the devil claims ownership. He owns you. 
You belong to him because you're serving him and doing his work and his will. Those who have God's name belong to God because they obey him and do his will. So when he talks about God's name being written on us and the name of New Jerusalem and the name, uh, Jesus says, my new name, what he's talking about is ownership, which grants us access. So when we are in heaven, we have full access to heaven. It's like coming home. When you come home to your house, you know, you can go in any room. You can open any door or whatever because you have the keys and it's yours and whatever. Your name is on the deed. That's the idea here, that when we are granted this new name in heaven, it's God's name, it's the city's name, we're home. And we have access and full access as God has granted us to it. So that's one aspect of the new name, that we belong in heaven. This is where we're supposed to be and God has welcomed us with open arms. The other aspect is that God is going to give us a name that is unique to us. And whatever that is, um, you know, no man knows saving the one that receiveth, receiveth it. Whatever that is, it has to do with, you know, your story, my, my story, your life, my life. We all face different tests and trials and challenges. We all come to to know God and his word in different ways and whatever that new name is it's unique to us as individuals and so we're not told what it is but it's meant to show that not only do we have access and do we belong in heaven but God knows each of us individually and he knows all of our stories and and he's been involved in your life as much as he's been involved in my life and, and he's the one who gives us the name. He knows what you've been through, and he knows how things apply to you, and he's going to give you that special name, as he'll do for all of us. And what a wonderful you know, thought that is, that God knows us so intimately and, and so honestly and openly that he can give us a name that nobody else will know about, but we'll know, and God will know, because it's between us and him. Then, of course, in heaven, there's the new song, and I just mentioned it, but we talked about it in our last lesson last Sunday, but it's the song of salvation, and it's new because of the salvation accomplished by Christ and the tremendous victory that we have through him. But that brings us back to where we started to Revelation 21, and when Jesus says, behold, I make all things new, it's in the context of our new home. Verse 1 says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto him, unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And so we have this beautiful picture of our eternal home coming out of uh, heaven as a bride prepared for her husband. It's a new heaven and a new earth. That's a, a Jewish idiom, a way of, of speaking. When they talked about heaven and earth, they meant earth is where you put your feet and heaven is where your head dwells. So heaven and earth is our dwelling place. Well, this is a new heaven and a new earth. It's not this earth. It's a new dwelling place. It's a spiritual place. It's that eternal home in heaven. And God will be with us immediately in fellowship. We will be in fellowship with him. All tears are wiped away because everything is made new what a beautiful thought that is not just to have a clean start but you might mess up again but all things are made new no more sorrow no more worrying no more anxiety no more temptation no more being tested to sin none of those things exist because Jesus has made everything new I can't help but when I think about that passage to think about the original creation in the Garden of Eden and how beautiful and perfect everything was. And if God can do that in a physical sense for man, think about what he can do for us in heaven, in that spiritual realm, when he makes all things new. 
We'll be new also. We'll have a new body. We'll have a new life that is eternal, and we can live with him forever in that wonderful home of heaven. And so Jesus promises to make all things new. That begins when we obey the gospel and become Christians. He makes us a new creation. We start living under a new testament. We engage in this new worship. And we have a new name, so we sing a new song, and we have this hope of this new home in heaven, all through the power of the blood of Christ. So hope as we think about that and you think about starting a new year, that we will decide to begin a new year by being a new creation in Christ. If you've never become a Christian, there's no better time to start your journey as a child of God. The steps are simple. Hear the gospel, believe it. Believe what it teaches about Jesus, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and be baptized for the remission of sins. You'll be raised to walk in newness of life on your way to a new home in heaven. If you've done that and become a child of God but haven't been living faithfully and you've wandered astray from that path of righteousness and you need to be made new again to start over, to have your sins washed away, confess those sins As you repent of them, ask God to forgive. We'll pray with you and for you, and he will do just that. He'll renew us. He'll restore us. And again, we'll be on our way to that new home in heaven. If you need to do that today, we'll help you in any way that we can. Why not come forward, respond as we stand and as we sing.